Hi everyone, Kate back for another quarantine ghost story and I will be reading the conclusion of Winthrop's Adventure by Vernon Lee and hopefully it's easy for you to find the first two parts if you had not seen those yet. I will actually go ahead and also make a playlist of all the ghost stories. It just occurred to me that could be helpful to people, especially if you're trying to find multiple parts of the same ghost story. I'll just put everything in order um, that they have been uploaded. So I've been very eager to find out what is going to happen in the conclusion of Winthrop's adventure. So here is chapter four, the final chapter. I gave a vigorous push to the old rotten door. It opened, creaking and I entered a vast, lofty hall, the entrance saloon of the noble old villa. As I stepped forward cautiously, I heard a cutting, hissing sound, and something soft and velvety brushed against my cheek. I stepped backwards and held up the lamp. It was only an owl whom the light had scared. It hooted dismally as it regained its perch. The rain fell sullen and monotonous. The only other sound was that of my footsteps, waking the echoes of the huge room. I looked about as much as the uncertain light of my two-wicked lamp permitted. The shiny marble pavement was visible only in a few places. Dust had formed a thick crust over it, and everywhere yellow maize seed was strewn about. In the middle were some broken chairs, tall gaunt chairs with remains of gilding and brocade, and some small wooden ones with their ragged straw half pushed out. Against a large oaken table rested some sacks of corn. In the corners were heaps of chestnuts and green and yellow silkworm cocoons, hoes, spades, and other garden implements. Roots and bulbs strewed the floor. The whole place was full of a vague, musty smell of decaying wood and plaster, of earth, of drying fruit and silkworms. I looked up. The rain battered in through the unglazed windows and poured in a stream over some remains of tracery and fresco. I looked higher, at the bare moldering rafters. Thus I stood, while the rain fell heavy and sullen, and the water splashed down outside from the roof. There I stood in the desolate room, in a stupid, unthinking condition. All this solemn, silent decay impressed me deeply, far more than I had expected. All my excitement seemed over. All my whims seemed to have fled. I almost forgot why I wished to be here. Indeed, why had I? That mad infatuation seemed wholly aimless and inexplicable. This strange, solemn scene was enough in itself. I felt at a loss what to do or even how to feel. I had the object of my wish. All was over. I was in the house. Further, I neither ventured to go nor dared to think of all the daredevil courting of the picturesque and the supernatural, which had hitherto filled me, was gone. I felt like an intruder, timid and humble, an intruder on solitude and ruin. I spread the horse cloth on the floor, placed the lamp by my side, wrapped myself in the peasant's cloak, leaned my head on a broken chair and looked up listlessly at the bare rafters, listening to the dull falling rain and to the water splashing from the roof, thoughts or feelings I appeared to have none. How long I remained, I cannot tell. The minutes seemed hours in this vigil, with nothing but the spluttering and flickering of the lamp within, the monotonous splash without, lying all alone, awake but vacant, vacant in the vast crumbling hall. I can scarcely tell whether suddenly or gradually I began to perceive, or thought I perceived, faint and confused sounds issuing I knew not whence. What they were I could not distinguish. All I knew was that they were distinct from the drop and splash of the rain. I raised myself on my elbow and listened. I took out my watch and pressed the repeater to assure myself I was awake. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight nine, ten, eleven, twelve tremulous ticks. I sat up and listened more intently, trying to separate the sounds from those of the rain outside. The sounds, silvery, sharp, but faint, seemed to become more distinct. Were they approaching or was I awaking? I rose and listened, holding my breath. I trembled. I took up the lamp and stepped forward. I waited a moment, listening again. There could be no doubt the light metallic sounds proceeded from the interior of the house. They were notes. The notes of some instrument. I went on cautiously. At the end of the hall was a crazy, gilded, battered door up some steps. I hesitated before opening it, for I had a vague, horrible feeling of what might be behind it. I pushed it open gently and by degrees and stood on the threshold, trembling and breathless. 
There was nothing save a dark, empty room. And then another. They had the cold, damp feeling and smell of a crypt. I passed through them slowly, startling the bats with my light, and the sounds, the sharp metallic chords, became more and more distinct, and as they did so, the vague, numbing terror seemed to gain more and more hold on me. I came to a broad spiral staircase, of which the top was lost in darkness, my lamp shedding a flickering light on the lower steps. The sounds were now quite distinct, the light, sharp, silvery sounds of a harpsichord or spinet. They fell clear and vibrating into the silence of the crypt-like house. A cold perspiration covered my forehead. I seized hold of the banisters of the stairs, and little by little dragged myself up like an inert mass. There came a chord, and delicately, insensibly, there glided into the modulations of the instrument the notes of a strange, exquisite voice. It was a wondrous, sweet, thick, downy quality, neither limpid nor penetrating, but with a vague, drowsy charm that seemed to steep the soul in innervating bliss. But... Together with this charm, a terrible cold seemed to sink into my heart. I crept up the stairs, listening and panting. On the broad landing was a folding gilded door, through whose interstices issued a faint glimmer of light, and from behind it proceeded the sounds. By the side of the door, but higher up, was one of those oval, ornamental windows. An old broken table stood beneath it. I summoned up my courage, and— Clamoring onto the unsteady table, raised myself on tiptoe to the level of the window, and, trembling, peeped through its dust-dimmed glass. I saw into the large, lofty room, the greater part of which was hidden in darkness, so that I could distinguish only the outline of the heavily curtained windows, and of a screen, and of one or two ponderous chairs. In the middle was a small, inlaid harpsichord, on which stood two wax lights, shedding a bright reflection on the shining marble floor and forming a pale yellowish mass of light yellowish mass of light in the dark room at the harpsichord turned slightly away from me sat a figure in the dress of the end of the last century a long pale lilac coat and pale green waistcoat and lightly powdered hair gathered into a black silk bag a deep amber-colored silk cloak was thrown over the chair back. He was singing intently and accompanying himself on the harpsichord. His back turned towards the window at which I was. I stood spellbound, incapable of moving as if all my blood were frozen and my limbs paralyzed, almost insensible save that I saw and I heard, saw and heard him alone. The wonderful, sweet, downy voice glided lightly and dexterously through the complicated mazes of the song. It rounded off ornament after ornament. It swelled imperceptibly into glorious, hazy magnitude and diminished, dying gently away from a high note to a lower one, like a weird, mysterious sigh. Then it leaped into a high, clear, triumphant note and burst out into a rapid, luminous shake. For a moment, he took his hands off the keys and turned partially round. My eyes caught his, and they were the deep, soft, yearning eyes of the portrait at Fa Isis. At that moment, a shadow was interposed between me and the lights, and instantly, by whom or how I know not, they were extinguished, and the room left in complete darkness. At the same instant, the modulation was broken off unfinished. The last notes of the piece changed into a long, shrill, quivering cry. There was a sound of scuffling and suppressed voices, the heavy, dead thud of a falling body, a tremendous crash, and another long, vibrating, terrible cry. The spell was broken. I started up, leaped from the table, and rushed to the closed door of the room. I shook its gilded panels twice and thrice in vain. I wrenched them asunder with a tremendous effort and entered. The moonlight fell in a broad white sheet through a hole in the broken roof, filling the desolate room with a vague greenish light. It was empty. Heaps of broken tiles and plaster lay on the floor. The water trickled down the stained wall and stagnated on the pavement. A broken fallen beam lay across the middle, and there, solitary and abandoned in the midst of the room, stood an open harpsichord, its cover encrusted with dust and split from end to end, its strings rusty and broken, its yellow keyboard thick with cobweb, the greenish-white light falling straight upon it. I was seized with an irresistible panic. 
I rushed out, caught up the lamp which I had left on the landing, and dashed down the staircase, never daring to look behind me, nor to the right or the left, as if something horrible and undefinable were pursuing me, that long, agonized cry continually ringing in my ears. I rushed on through the empty, echoing rooms and tore open the door of the large entrance hall. There, at least, I might be safe. When, just as I entered it, I slipped, my lamp fell and was extinguished, and I fell down, down, I know not where, and lost consciousness. When I came to my senses, gradually and vaguely, I was lying at the extremity of the vast entrance hall of the crumbling villa, at the foot of some steps, the fallen lamp by my side. I looked round all dazed and astonished. The white morning light was streaming into the hall. How had I come there? What had happened to me? Little by little, I recollected. And as the recollection returned, so also returned my fear, and I rose quickly. I pressed my hand to the aching head, and I drew it back, stained with a little blood. I must, in my panic, have forgotten the steps and fallen, so that my head had struck against the sharp base of a column. I wiped off the blood took the lamp and the cloak and horse cloth, which lay there where I had left them, spread on the dust-encrusted marble floor amidst the sacks of flour and the heaps of chestnuts, and staggered through the room, not well aware whether I was really awake. At the doorway, I paused and looked back once more on the great bare hall with its moldering rafters and decaying frescoes, the heaps of rubbish and garden implements, its sad, solemn ruin. I opened the door and went out onto the long flight of steps before the house and looked wonderingly at the serenely lovely scene. The storm had passed away, leaving only a few hazy white clouds in the blue sky. The soaking earth steamed beneath the already strong sun. The yellow corn was beaten down and drenched. The maize and vine leaves sparkled with raindrops. The tall green hemp gave out its sweet, fresh scent. Before me lay the broken-up garden with its overgrown box hedges its immense decorated lemon vases, its spread out silkworm mats, its tangle of weeds and vegetables and flowers, further the waving green plain with its avenues of tall poplars stretching in all directions, and from its midst rose the purple and gray walls and roofs and towers of the old town. Hens were cackling about in search of worms in the soft moist earth, and the deep clear sounds of the great cathedral bell floated across the fields, Looking down on all this fresh, lovely scene, it struck me more vividly than ever before how terrible it must be to be cut off forever from all this, to lie blind and deaf and motionless, moldering underground. The idea made me shudder and shrink from the decaying house. I ran down to the road. The peasants were there, dressed in their gayest clothes, red, blue, cinnamon, and pea green, busy piling vegetables into a light cart, painted with vine wreaths and souls in the flames of purgatory. A little further, at the door of the white arcaded farmhouse, with its sundial and wonderful donkey, while one of the girls mounted on a chair was placing a fresh wreath of berries and a fresh dripping nosegay before the little faded Madonna shrine. When they saw me, they all cried out and came eagerly to meet me. Well, asked the priest, did you see any ghosts? Did you do the devil's picture? laughed the girl. I shook my head with a forced smile. Why, exclaimed the lad, the signore has hurt his forehead. How could that have happened? The lamp went out and I stumbled against a sharp corner, I answered hastily. They noticed that I seemed ill and pale, and I attributed it to my fall. One of the women ran into the house and returned with a tiny bulb-shaped glass bottle filled with some greenish fluid. Rub some of this into the cut, she directed. This is infallible. It will cure any wound. It is some holy oil more than a hundred years old left us by our grandmother. I shook my head but obeyed and rubbed some of the queer-smelling green stuff onto the cut without noticing any particularly miraculous effect. They were going to the fair. When the cart was well stocked, they all mounted onto its benches, till it tilted upwards with the weight. The lad touched his shaggy old horse, and off they rattled, waving their hats and handkerchiefs at me. The priest cour courteously offered me a seat beside him in his gig. I accepted mechanically, and off we went, behind the jingling cart of the peasants, through the muddy lanes where the wet boughs bent over us, and we brushed the drops off the green hedges. The priest was highly talkative, but I scarcely heard what he said, for my head ached and reeled. I looked back at the deserted villa, a huge dark mass in the shiny green fields of hemp and maize, and shuddered. "'You're unwell,' said the priest. "'You must have taken cold in that confounded, damp old hole.' We entered the town, crowded with carts and peasants, passed through the marketplace with its grand old buildings, all festooned with tinware and onions and colored stuffs and whatnot, 
and he set me down at my inn, where the sign of the three pilgrims swings over the door. Goodbye, goodbye, arrivederci, to our next meeting, he cried. Arrivederci, I answered faintly. I felt numb and sick. I paid my bill and sent off my luggage at once. I longed to be out of the city. I knew instinctively that I, I was on the eve of a bad illness, and my only thought was to reach Venice while I yet could. I proved right. The day after my arrival in Venice, the fever seized me and kept fast hold of me many a week. That's what comes of remaining in Rome until July, curled all my, cried all my friends, and I let them continue in their opinion. Winthrop paused and remained for a moment with his head between his hands. None of us made any remark, for we were at a loss as to what to say. That air, the one I heard that night, he added after a moment, and its opening words, those on the portrait, Si Regina Io Pastoro Sono, remained deep in my memory. I took every opportunity of discovering whether such an air really existed. I asked lots of people and ransacked half a dozen musical archives. I did find an air, even more than one, with those words, which appeared to have been set by several composers, but on trying them over at the piano, they proved totally different from the one in my mind. The consequence, naturally, was that, as the impression of the adventure grew fainter, I began to doubt whether it had not been all a delusion, a nightmare phantasm due to overexcitement and fever and due to the morbid, vague desire for something strange and supernatural. Little by little, I settled down in this idea, regarding the whole story as a, an hallucination. As to the air, I couldn't explain that. I shuffled it off, half explained, and tried to forget it. But now, on suddenly hearing that very same air from you, on being assured of its existence outside my imagination, the whole scene has returned to me in all its vividness, and I feel compelled to believe. Can I do otherwise? Tell me, is it reality or fiction? At any rate, he added, rising and taking his hat and trying to speak more lightly, will you forgive my begging you never to let me hear that piece again? Be assured you shall not, answered the countess, pressing his hand. It makes even me feel a little uncomfortable now. Besides, the comparison would be too much to my disadvantage. Ah, uh, my dear Winthrop, do you know, I think I would almost spend a night in the Villa Negri in order to hear a song of Cimarosa's time sung by the singer of the last century. I knew you wouldn't believe a word of it, was Winthrop's only reply. Thus ends Winthrop's adventure. I hope you enjoyed that one. It had quite a crazy conclusion to it um and it seemed nobody really took it very seriously so tomorrow i will be starting by charlotte riddell who is very famous for the yellow wallpaper which i actually have not read either i've just been saving it for some time in the future but this one is called the old house in vauxhall walk and let's see how many sections i think this is going to take me maybe just two days yeah, two days to read. So I will be back tomorrow for another story. I hope you are enjoying these and have a lovely day. Bye.